Thank you for joining us here at Radio Juxtapose. Coming up today, we eavesdrop on a conversation between Juxtapose magazine's Evan Preco, former guest Anna Park, and the pop art legend Peter Saul. Both guests today are alumni of the New York Academy of Arts, where Peter is due to be honoured at the Artists for Artists Gala. At 87 years old, Peter Saul is by far the most experienced guest we've had grace us here at Radio Juxtapose. In the early 50s, Peter studied at both the California School of Fine Arts and Washington University in St. Louis. He then later went on to teach in Austin, Texas. Heavily influenced by comic books and Mad Magazine, Peter's hyper-colourful, acid-soaked worlds would melt contemporary culture and political satire into backdrops of pure surrealism. From the war in Vietnam to the migrant detention centres, the dark subject matter within his narratives heavily contrasted the luminous colour palettes that he chooses to paint with. In 2020, just as the severity of the COVID-19 outbreak was being realised, Peter's exhibition, Crime and Punishment, at Brooklyn's new museum, offered an unsettlingly well-timed journey through some of recent history's bloodiest times. Joining Peter and Evan is former Radio Juxtapose guest, New York-based painter Anna Park. When we spoke with her back in 2019, Anna was already an artist in the spotlight, and the speed and scale of this popularity has only since grown. Though the grey scale in her charcoaled works may differ from the colour in Peter's, the chaos embedded within the imagery is equally as debauched. As we congratulate Peter for not only being honoured but on his lifelong contribution to art, join us now as we hear from two artists who may be generations apart but are united in their ability to find comfort in the uncomfortable. You're listening to Radio Juxtapose. What a great time to start this conversation after what is known as the Super Bowl of the art world, Art Basel, Miami, and just like there's generations we're talking about here and there's generations between Anna and Peter. Peter, in your life, as you've been a painter for decades and Anna, as you're, you're a young in, but you're, you're kind of emerging into this really interesting contemporary art world. How important is it, Peter, to like still go to these things like Art Basel and like watch and observe what's happening? Uh, well, I think it's important to be present as a human being and talk to people. But as far as actually seeing stuff, no, it hasn't been important to me. I mean, I've, <laughs> we've been to Art Basel. We've been to Art Basel three times. And it was interesting all three times. Don't know. I mean, this last time was, was great, really. I mean, I, I felt very appreciated. And this is unusual and a good sign for the art. But uh, I haven't thought about it deeply. You better ask Anna that question. Anna, like, how important to you is this dialogue between yourself and other artists, like, at this point in your career? Like, are you actively seeking out conversations with other artists? And, like, what are you learning? What are the tools that you're learning? I think it's important to kind of, in whatever capacity, like immerse yourself, but I, as long as it's organic, you know, and I think what Peter mentioned being present is really important, but I know that, you know, going to like our fairs or like shows, it's not like everyone's cup of tea, but it's more for, I don't know, like I love going to see shows and I love going to see art in person. I love meeting other artists and for the most part, everyone's like really kind of, you know, we're all kind of in this, like cacophony of like this art world mess together. So it's it's nice to find like camaraderie throughout it all. So yeah, I think it's important. Well, I'd like to change my answer. <laughs> you know, I think it's important too. I didn't realize when I got into art that it was going to be a real, a career thing, a, a profession. I thought it was a way to avoid going to an office building or getting well, yeah. told what to do when you get there. And after about 15 or 20 years, I realized I was wrong. And I began to know other artists and uh, all's well. I mean, I, I think it's okay. I admit that now that I found out the truth that it's a profession like any other, 
I want to get ahead too. I want to get my share of art appreciation. I want to talk to the other artists, find out what they think. I'm talking to artists more and more, but I also forget more and more what I just said. So, <laughs> that's my answer. Peter, that's a really good point because I feel like the era that you came out of or into, or it was there maybe was less, was there less like exhibition opportunities? It feels like nowadays younger artists have an opportunity to show in different places, uh, maybe in a oh, way. Yes, I think so. Yes, yes. There's many more shows. In fact, art is so gigantic. I can't even believe it. It's like the third thing happening in Manhattan. You got real estate, finance, and art. Bong, bong, bong. Right. And I don't know what happened to law and medicine and all these other things that are so important. <laughs> they dropped out of sight. <laughs> what are those? Crazy. We don't... <laughs> Yeah, who knows what the laws are anymore? So, or <laughs> when this was discovered about twenty years ago, that art was a nice thing to be, easy money, and so on. Uh, you you began to find that people wanted to be artists, and they felt left out. If they felt that there was some reason why they were left out, like living in the wrong place, wrong skin color, wrong age, oh golly a hundred different things, wrong gender. They got mad. Hey, I want my share of that art appreciation. And it makes sense. It is easy. As a way to spend time, making art is not like pushing boxes in a hardware store, back of a hardware store or something. It's very pleasant. Okay. And what do you think about that art being you know, the practice, the ritual of art making. I mean, we've been, I've interviewed you a few times at this point, but you know, I haven't interviewed you in the last like a couple of years um, as you've kind of, a, you know, your gallery schedules picked up. Like, do you, are you finding like the ritual of practice to be something that's like not pushing boxes and you're really enjoying it or how? Well, I definitely enjoy it. I still, my idea of a work day is one o'clock to seven o'clock approximately. That's nice. That's like gold, you know? Like, yeah, that structure is <laughs> what I'm looking for. <laughs> no, I, I think it's like a privilege, you know, that we get to do this every day. And um, yeah, I could have never imagined like I could be doing it to sustain myself. And I don't know, you know, obviously there's days where I'm just like pretty much crying in a corner or just, you know, my worst day possible. I'm realizing it's probably the best day I'll have like back home, you know, when I was stuck in like suburban Utah. So, you know, I can't really complain, <laughs> honestly. Yeah, Utah is the hardest state to be in, isn't it? It's yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, um, uh, you know, it's beautiful. Uh, I didn't take advantage of the nature as much, but um, it's definitely, you feel like very comatose almost like it's a very quiet place, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought that it was a place that was very strict. It yeah. Well, that too. It's like things. kind of fighting those two things, I guess. Strengthens you as an artist, right? Yeah, yeah most definitely. I think it um, definitely made me who I am now, like kind of like, you know, I had to really easily adapt to various different situations and being in Utah for most of like my childhood, it kind of forced me to like quickly, I don't know, change into these different roles, I guess. But I was still like fighting against it, you know, like I wanted to like so deeply get out of there for, <laughs> for a long time. Um, that's why I'm like more grateful to be in New York or like, you know, be able to travel and kind of have that perspective too. I actually am really glad this conversation is heading this direction because I had this in my notes about how strict rules make you break rules. Mm -hmm. And Peter, you came from a time where like maybe the subject matter you were painting was was uh, was definitely breaking rules. And Anna, oh, yeah. as if like you coming from Utah, like you're breaking rules as well personally, and if if not just you know culturally, like how what do you guys think about the idea of breaking rules as an artist or breaking habits and and that creating new rules? It's what you define it as, right? Like well, either the environment kind of drives you to be, to challenge yourself and um, uh, to break these rules or or you set these rules yourself, like these parameters. You know, like I feel like with the medium I chose for myself, it's very strict parameters. And maybe that's kind of a reflection of like where 
I was living in Utah where I, I was trying to find a way, like a more creative way to kind of find my own. Well, I'm glad you paint pictures. I mean, in, I mean, we have in common large <laughs> angular surface, right? Yeah. That's good. <laughs> but today, art could be anything. You can make a movie of an ice cube melting. It's probably been done 25 times by graduate <laughs> students, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> it could be anything. Art only means man-made. So theoretically, according to the language, uh, a cup... Um, a salad bowl is just as much art as Rembrandt's Night Watch. Mm -hmm. They're just both examples of art, you know. You remember like the first, like the first art review you ever got, and what it said? Uh, not exactly, but I was soon discovered to be the worst of the pop artists, and I just kept <laughs> on going. You know, I kind of enjoyed that. I looked upon art as a rebellion against my fate. My fate was to put on a necktie, go to an office building, and talk about money if you're successful. If you're unsuccessful, you're in the basement shoving around cartons. So it's, that's the thing. And I didn't want to do either one. I just didn't want to. I refused to be told what to do, and I haven't been, and uh, all's well. Donald Judd gave me a bad review, but I've forgotten it, you know? Also, <laughs> other people, very important critics, Lawrence Alloway, the one who was married to Frank Stella, who is that? You know, Barbara woman. Barbara Rose. Barbara Rose, Barbara Rose. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, I understand now that from the art critic's point of view, they have to give a bad review to somebody. And it's more practical to give it to someone who lives in a foreign country and is not about to show up. You Hello. don't want to give your bad review to the person next door living in a loft. And he might see you in the bar and take offense. <laughs> That, that's my actual thought. That is a really good point. You know, I, I was, I had this conversation, I've had a few of these conversations with artists who feel as if often their home country will give them the worst reviews, but then they will end up getting their, they always like end up getting like a museum retrospective in their, in their home country first. It's like a weird kind of like, like a conversation with criticism of their, of their career. It sounds, sounds to me like a great deal. I say yes to that, you know. Who cares about the review to get to show your work and amuse him? Figurative art was something that, like, you know, as of, you know, almost 15 years ago was, was something that wasn't as, you know, critically acclaimed as it has been recently. Like, I just want to talk about how you got yourself into figurative art at school and maybe how a generation of, of peers has been doing figurative art. It was kind of like a natural thing. My, my old mentor, that's all. He told me if I could draw the figure, I could do anything. And, you know, me being like 15 and 16, I was like, you're right. Like I should, I should be able to master whatever, you know, it is like painting or drawing the figure. And it, um, you know, you're, you're constantly like interacting with other human beings. And I think it's, it's natural of us to kind of want to depict that. And maybe that's also why there's this like huge, um, excitement and re resurgence for figuration. I don't know. And also being in um, New York Academy of Art, like I, the reason why I went to the school was because that was touted, you know, like, like a lot of, a lot of focus was on it. And that's kind of what I was seeking for maybe in um, my previous like at, at Pratt, which is more like conceptual. So it was, it was a good balance of like having both those things. Yeah. Peter, what would you say that you, when you, what you gained or like what you kind of saw from your peers years ago about figurative painting? What did I learn? Or what, what was like the, what was the conversation about figurative art when you first started? Well, art was supposed to be figurative, but it was understood that the exciting part of it was abstract expressionism. And if you wanted to be part of the future, that was it. So I was just very careful to, and be rebellious against what was expected of me. I realized right away that you have to be different to be noticed, that it's pointless to be a modern artist like every other modern artist. There were too many modern artists even in 1950 to even <laughs> remember their names, no kidding. And now of course there's like 800,000 modern artists worldwide. And I mean, you're not gonna know even the tiniest fraction or as anyone else, it's just a huge thing like law, medicine, or anything else. I don't know why that is exactly, but uh, anyway, so 
art was figurative. And for some reason, I don't understand. The artists who were figurative at, in 1948, whenever I think it was about, they didn't continue to get more interesting. Mm -hmm. they, they somehow just sort of conked out. I would have been more interesting myself. If it had been me who was Reginald Marsh in 1948, eight or whatever, if he was alive then, name occurred to me, I would definitely have tried harder to be more interesting to look at, to counteract Jackson Pollock and uh, de Kooning and Rothko and so on, who weren't all that interesting to look at, in my opinion. Mainly they were really interesting to know about. They got drunk, you know what I mean? They did the wrong thing. They they tormented women, you know, all that kind of thing. Like, oh, they were bad. Okay, okay. <laughs> but uh, they, their actual artwork wasn't that interesting to look at. And my actual opinion is that you have to have the human figure or something to do with the human form in order to be interesting to look at. Otherwise, you got to use something else like price tag. It's got to cost $10 million. Okay, I'll look at it. You know what I mean? That kind of thing. Which doesn't really count, in my opinion. In my opinion, the only thing that really matters is the visual. you got to have the visuals. And that means you got to have the figure. So was that something that was being taught at the time in art school, or is that something that you rebelled against and started to do? Well, all my thinking is my own, I think, in this. I mean, I can barely remember art school. Art school was a little... Something that happened between 52 and 56. And it was a long time ago. And the teachers liked me. They, they liked that I wanted to be an artist, even if they thought my work was nonsense. You know, they, they were so grateful for my being there because yeah. all students were taking something called commercial art. And yeah. if, if it hadn't been for a tiny group, including me, they wouldn't have had a job. Did you go into art school thinking that you were going to be like a commercial illustrator or did you think you were going to be an exhibiting fine artist painter? Well, I knew I was going to be a painter. The art school was chosen by my parents to give me a chance to reconsider my very disastrous change of mind from business <laughs> to art. I mean, it's just like it wasn't on the on this radar to be an artist in 1950. In, nine, in, in America, it just wasn't something you thought about. It's all history now. I, I think an important thing right now is probably different. There's so many artists and the work all looks so good somewhat. I mean, hundreds of thousands of people have mastered fine arts, everything <laughs> about it, from looking different to looking good. Well, it's just like, it's incredible. It'll have to be redefined somehow during the next, uh, 40 or 50 years, there'll have to be a redefinition. Art form will have to be published locally just to include the shows nearby, you know, that kind of thing. And uh, did you go into art school thinking that you were going to be able to have exhibitions? I mean, was that the ambition? The ambition was merely to sell and live through my life without having this affliction of business thrust on me. I was just going to, I was so happy to be isolated. I, I was completely abnormal. I found a girlfriend who felt the same way I did. And we were just so happy not speaking the language, not talking to anybody, just way out there in a foreign country, sitting and drinking beer. Ah, oh, wonderful, wonderful. That sounds like the dream, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I'm kind of a hermit myself. So that's, yeah, that sounds amazing. You know, it's supposed to be a bad side mentally, but actually, I feel like that. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, you know, it's, it's like, I feel like um, being an artist, like you learn day to day how it is to be alone. And, you know, and because it is, so much of, I mean, it depends on everyone's practice, of course, but I personally, it's, it's more solitary. And I do surround myself with people that like get, that understand that fully, like they're, they're okay being by themselves too. So. Well, I, you know, I took the liberty of looking up your work on the computer screen. Oh. <laughs> you know what I mean? I wanted to find out what you, we both did, Sally and I wanted to see what you were up to. <laughs> and uh, it seems to me you, you've chosen a medium, large, large uh, drawings with, with uh, chalk or charcoal. Char 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 
Yeah. Isn't yeah. that isn't that a very fragile thing that could easily be damaged? Um, you need helpers to sort of hold it steady, or <laughs> I, I wish I had helpers. <laughs> <laughs> So it's it's fairly delicate medium, but um, it's very forgiving in a way. So I think that's I like that kind of um, balance of it. Yeah. yeah. Does that mean if you don't like it, you just flick it with your finger and it falls off, or what? Oh, <laughs> uh, if I don't like it, I'll just throw it out <laughs> or burn it. I don't know. <laughs> Either way. <laughs> you don't find it hard to handle by yourself physically. Oh well, I mean more like the physicality of it because I, I like working larger, but um, yeah, it's, it's kind of like a nice, I like to be very active with the work and like the only thing is I wish I had more upper body strength for, for some of the <laughs> things, but that's <laughs> hopefully someday. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. no, they have muscle building classes today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I'll do both. <laughs> yeah. How, how important is it to have like a studio assistant to work with? I mean, do, do either of you, like, is that something that Peter, I don't know your, your studio situation, but is it something that like having a studio assistant is very helpful or is it what you want? Or do you guys just like the alone time and don't want that? Well, fortunately I've just continued to work alone and Sally works alone downstairs on ceramics and it's a very nice lifestyle. I mean, we simply don't, have assistance, no. Although I'm cheating a little bit when I say that because I, I might get my stretcher bars from upstate and a guy brings them down and then I go and buy canvas and a, a, another person comes and takes it away and puts it together and brings it back. So I always have nice, clean, ready to go surface to paint on, which is nice. Although until that started about seven or eight years ago, I used to do everything myself, but as soon as you stop, you don't have the muscle power anymore. That's not cheating, Peter. That's fine. You have people coming in just to drop something off. They're not, you know, that's not cheating. I don't have anyone touch the canvas yeah. with, people yeah. with me. And Amazing. I don't ask for any advice on what to do in the painting either, because oh. <laughs> I don't want to know anyone's opinion. At the end of the day, like, you know what's best for the work. I, I would have a hard time have, having people work on the pieces. I don't know. It's a very intimate process. And like, I don't, yeah, I don't know how I would be able to have assistants do that. Did the last 18 months or so change either of your practices or routines? Honestly, it was kind of the, the same. I feel, I feel like artists always say like, Right, to be honest, <laughs> I it's mean, for sure, it's the clear. mental part of it was definitely jarring, you know. Um, yeah, I, I actually kind of liked being it, there, was really no social like obligations, and you know, I, although I miss, miss my friends and family, um, like a part of it, I actually was like, oh wow, this is really undisturbed, um, time. I don't know, <laughs> is that bad to say that? <laughs> oh, I felt the same, I felt the same. The last thing I did before the world shut down was I went and saw your show at the new museum. It was the last social thing I did. Oh, yeah. Well, gee, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I think that was the last like big show I saw, too, before uh, going under lockdown. <laughs> yeah. I took a few friends from England to go see your show, and uh, I think we all kind of had this feeling that maybe things were going to slightly alter in the coming weeks, and it was a good goodbye to uh, the modern world a little bit. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I didn't mind the, the, the virus on that level either. I mean, you worry about getting it and your family getting it and so on, but it didn't bother my work day. I don't think it bothered either of our work days. We just calmly continue doing what we do. Do you get to soak in kind of the adulation that you're getting at the moment? Like, like you've had museum no, retrospect. Not really. It doesn't soak in because, uh, I feel it's not fair if you pay no attention to bad reviews, if you just think they're a joke, then it's not fair to pay a lot of attention to the ones that are good, you know? You have to sort of keep an arm's a distance from all reviews and, and realize that it's just a changing scene. And all objects are basically equal on this level. I mean, you know, it, it could be Grandma Moses, Picasso, de Kooning, anyone could be honored suddenly, whoosh, boom, there they are. It could be the worst artist you've ever met. It could be your grandmother. 
It could be anyone. It could be a teenager. It could be anybody. Anybody can be a world famous artist instantly if enough important people think they are. And that's just the way it is. And if for some reason you're flung into this group towards the top, thank your lucky stars. But I'd never think of it. I, I try not to think of art appreciation. I think about art, meaning my pictures, and one person standing in front of one of my pictures. And had, does my picture have sufficient amount of the interest to be looked at? Uh, an art collector told me the average time spent looking at a picture is seven seconds. <laughs> and maybe it's true, I don't know, but so often I go to an art show and I don't spend long looking at the pictures, then I feel guilty. And when it's got a lot of human figure, like say Alice Neal, mm -hmm. I can look at it longer. I can look at it longer than when it's just important because for some other reason. I, I have a good time with the human figure. I like to look at the different versions of it. You know, the whole thing. I like Jerome. I like the academic artists. I like the ones that mess it up. I like the whole group. Soutine, he's good too. The whole bunch, I like them all. Did you have to go through a period of time where like every single review and every single moment like really affected you or were you, is that, is this like something that you've learned over the years or is that the approach you've always had? I, I've always had the approach. It, yeah. it came to me immediately when I got the first reports of my reviews, which were <laughs> that there was a new kind of world shaking art movement afoot called pop and Lichtenstein was the main person and the Rosenquist too. Warhol was not known about yet but I was slightly known and I was known as the worst. <laughs> so I felt it wasn't, it wasn't any good. And I thought, hey, that's okay. But I just got this impression it could be faulty. For some reason, I like to look at the bad stuff and it offends <clears throat> my friends, but it's life, you know? When I go to a bookstore and I'm looking for stuff to browse in, I look at the memoirs of German generals from World War II, gloomy stuff, you know? <laughs> I was an SS sergeant, that kind of thing. I regret it. Okay, let's hear about it. <laughs> that kind of thing. I, I, I like the bad stuff. And I feel like you have to respond to that. What, like, you know, you have a, there's a little bit of darkness in what you do as well. You've kind of looked. I hope so. I hope so. <laughs> it's kind of like, it's like you're always like watching, you know, it's kind of like when you look at a car crash and you can't look away, kind of, you know what I mean? I feel like we're, we're just drawn to these like um, events we live, we're living through, I guess. So I think you're, um, I guess Peter said, I think I do like looking at work that kind of, I don't know, I really don't like, but I, I, it's almost more interesting than something that I'm never going to remember ever again. Cause it's, uh, at least it's triggering something in my, like in my system. Peter, as you kind of, again, as you're getting honored at the school and kind of looking at the, the current environment of painters, are you, do you feel like art is in a good place at the moment? Oh, yes. It's one of the best places to be. There's no question of that. I mean, people who get to be known as artists right now are lucky and they're flocking to it from all corners of the world, from Iceland to... Uh, <laughs> wherever the opposite of Iceland is, <laughs> modern art, yeah, there's no cool. question. It's just that I don't understand why, frankly. I don't understand where it all goes or how it's ever going to be looked at. I, I can't imagine, but it's happening. One thing you haven't asked me about is my experience as an art teacher, and, and that was very formative for me and had a big influence on me. <laughs> I realized after I'd been teaching for about five or 10 years that the average, that everybody has a lot of imagination, just like they have, they have a, their own sense of color and all that kind of stuff, but they can only imagine nice things. I'm very unusual in as much as I can imagine horrible stuff with impunity. That's very unusual. 
I mean, most people can't do that. They would try. My students would sometimes try and say things like, okay, Peter Saul, I'm going to do it too. You're not the only person who can make tough stuff. I'm going to do it. But then after about a week or two, they say, oh, it's no use. No one's going to look at this. This is so depressing. I quit. And it's back to the bowl of flowers, which I just started painting myself. Because <laughs> I wanted to break my rules, too. It's no fair just breaking the rules that are there. You have to break your own rules. All rules broken. It's just a, a relaxation time. Time to sit in the studio and do something you hope will be interesting. That's the way I see it. But I do notice that most people can't imagine anything unpleasant. It's just the way it goes. So, so Peter, do you, is it hard to teach rules when you're trying to break rules or did you try not to teach rules? I never taught anything like that. I just tried to speak to the student and find out they were not planning to be artists. My students never planned to be artists. They were just ordinary people who were taking an art course. Out of 17 students that were always in the class from one to seven showed an interest in actually continuing to paint. I never tried to teach them anything. I tried to help them to realize the painting they were trying to make, which was something like, look, I just love Van Gogh and I want to paint like that. Okay, here's how we can go about that. Or Rothko, I, I, I love his big sheets of color. How can I do that? So I would help them to get into that. I helped them to do what they wanted gloomy castles in the forest that they once saw out of a train window. Okay, let's do it. Let's do portraits of the boyfriend, portraits of the girlfriend. And sometimes they could surprise you. For instance, one woman brings me this photograph. She's going to do this picture of her boyfriend. She says, uh, look, he's, he's really wonderful and he's very handsome, but I have to change the expression. A little bit. I have to do this and do that to him. And I thought, here we go. Total <laughs> chaos. But it wasn't. She did exactly that. And I was impressed. And I was impressed by a student who painted a picture of the environment. I forgot her name by now and everything else. But she was first, in uh, my estimation, in doing... Um, that kind of a painting where you show what goes wrong in the environment. She did it. I was very impressed. And there were several other impressive incidents. I, I really enjoyed my teaching job immensely. I, I felt as one of the most, the two things that have formed me to my present moment are A, happy marriage, B, teaching job, just like one, two. And after that was over, I'm relaxed. I'm just me. It's a simple life. <laughs> Okay, I'm getting an accusation <laughs> of simplicity. It's probably true. You go ahead and ask a few questions. I've yogged, I've hogged conversation. Anna, what's the best advice you got from um, from school? Best advice I got from school. I think it's just find the right group of people. I know that sounds so dumb. It really wasn't really about art. It was kind of just like at the end of the day after all the stuff and the shows, like it really, the your friends and like the people around you are what, what are important. But then I also think like the advice, well not advice, like I think a lot of doubts that some of my professors had was important to me too. Cause they were like, you just think it's gonna all work out, don't you? And I'm like, I don't know, yeah. <laughs> Weirdly, you need that. You need that kind of like blind like optimism. And I still have that to this day. I'm kind of like, yeah. I mean, what else? I can make drawings, I can paint too, and I, you know, every day. And if I work hard enough, hopefully it'll work out. I mean, I think I think that idea of um finding your peers and finding your friends in an art community is it's also like as somebody who writes about art for a living it's it's very it's very, i think that's the advice i would give to people too yeah, we, we can get so wrapped up in in the whole like you know um finding your own and like especially in like a career profession where everything is just like like constantly changing and nobody really knows like there's no one way of like going about it so at the end of the day your constants will be the the people around you you know so right. yeah Amazing, we can do this from different parts of the world, so it, it, it's much appreciated. Thank you. Thank well, you so much for 
doing this. Yeah. And this was such an amazing conversation. Yeah. What a nice way to like start the day, honestly. <laughs>